Hi, everybody. Hello. It's like the day went by really fast, yeah. really, really fast. Um, in my session this morning with the 25s and unders, I made this list, it's kind of weird, a little bit awkward to put it out there, but I'm just going to do it because um, whenever I am hiking on steep paths, I like to follow somebody who knows what they're doing. So like Loretta, I really like to hike with Loretta because she knows what she's doing. And I watch where she puts her feet and then I put my feet there. And even if it's not maybe a path that, that would suit my body type because she's a little bit taller, it still is leading the way to help me get to places. So with that in mind, I, um, I made a list. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a systems person and for since 1992, I've been memorizing scripture, and it wasn't until this last month that I actually made a record of the scripture that I memorized. So if I lost my cards, it would have been so sad. And my daughter, who is Esther, who is a systems person, was like, Mom, type them up. So I did. And uh, I made it available to um, the women this morning. Not, this is, it's, like I said, it's awkward for me but it's probably awkward for Loretta when I'm right behind her following her. She's trying to talk to me and I'm just like, where do I go next? And so, so I, I get that sometimes being in the front is a little awkward. But um, when I first started memorizing scripture, I took people's packets and saw what they were memorizing. Then I memorized that too. So if you are like, I want to start, but I don't know where, here's just a list of verses that I have. You are going to look up some of these references and go, why in the world did she memorize that? because I didn't know what I was doing and I was just memorizing scripture, but it is in my mind and God doesn't waste anything. And then there are some stuff that is transformational still and have little things. Um, I didn't make it easy for you. You have to look up the verse yourself, but biblegateway.com. So just type in the reference and there it is in every translation you can want. So they're up here. I don't have very many if they run out and you're like, man, I really wanted those. I have this thing called email. It wasn't invented when I started memorizing scripture. <laughs> this is a true story. A lot of you have heard it. I am, um, I took a class in college called Communication and Technology. Again, I know a lot of you have heard this, but just bear with the old story, please. Um, and the professor said, if you get an email address and email me your assignments, I'll give you extra credit. And I was like, Psh, I don't need no email address. I don't need extra credit either. So I didn't do it because what is email anyway? And in that class, we went to the library and it, was, it felt like to my little country, New Mexico, pop, uh, class size of 10 self, to this dark room in the library where there was a woman dressed in all black with black frames teaching us about this crazy thing called the internet. <laughs> and I was like, I will never use that. <laughs> I'm not a future thinker. <laughs> That's my funny old story. Has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. It's just extra free. And I think it's just a random story because I have a lot of anticipation in my heart because I feel like this is a really important message. I think in, in a lot of times retreat settings or camp, Saturday night, Saturday night is the hit them with this. But that was last night, if you didn't get that. <laughs> Um, so tonight, I think it can have potential to be heavy, but what I'm praying and hoping for is that it is deeply encouraging and challenging and inspiring for you to put on your new self. And this is how. Uh, every year on, set, on Friday night, I go to my room and I'm like, what did I even say? I have no idea. And I struggled for a long time waking up off and on all night long of, ah. Oh, I didn't really tell them about how to put on their new selves. I just left them with the poopy pants. And then when I woke up and I started looking through it and talking to a few people who talked me off the cliff, and I was like, all right, that's tonight. So I didn't leave it out last night. It just wasn't time for it yet. I think sometimes we have to sit with the imagery in order to go to the, the goodness. So open your Bibles to Colossians 3, if you're not already there. Tonight we are going to be in verses 12 through 16, and the title, I, you know how Chad's like, in da 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 title, I'm just, I'm a simple woman. Tonight's title is Chosen, Holy, and Beloved. <laughs> it's 
what the passage is about. So that's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to read the whole thing again so that it continues to get in us. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath, is, wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I love that section. Our new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, some uncircumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, I, I am a broken record, and I used to care, but I don't care anymore. But this passage is in me, and when I read it, my mind is going to all of the things that God has, has done in my life. Just this last week, I have been studying this for a couple months now, like I said, and I hadn't noticed in that passage until this week when I'm quoting it to myself in my car over and over that, that Paul uses the language that is is almost like an urgency. And do this, and then do this, and do this, and do this. And I was like, man, there's a lot of ands in this. So it's, it's just this continuation of put on your new self, and this is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like. And I uh, used to, in, in my old self, because I'm being renewed in the knowledge after the image of, its, of my creator, I would hide often my true self. Because in, especially sometimes in women's circles, in some women's circles, being feely and all of this is like celebrated. That's all that's celebrated. And in some women's circles, it's like, oh, you're so feely and da, da, da. And so for me, who I am a deep feeler, that I feel things in my guts and I, it just overwhelms me sometimes. And I was very ashamed of that sometime. And I think part of it is the family that I grew, at, grew up in. And I think part of it is being in women's ministry and making vows that were not holy. Like our women's ministry will not be like other women's ministries. Like what, what is that even about? How judgmental is that of me of other women's ministries? They're seeking Jesus too in the way that they seek Jesus. And so I'm here to tell you, if you didn't already know, I'm really feely, really, really feely. And also to give you freedom, you don't have to be like me. You be you. You be like God has designed you. And I was, it was after a gathering. I can't remember exactly what was happening, but it was a, it was a really big deal. It might have been the last week of Corinthians. Not this last one where we reviewed, but the one before that when it was just this monumental thing for me of look what we've been through in the last two and a half years. And 
the, the songs that we sang that day, never once did you leave us on our own, and Jesus, we love you, and all of these things. And I, it was just this, ugh. sometimes it's hard for me to talk to people after the gathering because I'm like, Ugh. and Chad and Kyle are sitting behind me who are not feely feelers. And I was like, guys, if you could just have two minutes of what I'm feeling inside. And Kyle said, I don't think I could handle 30 seconds. <laughs> and so I don't want you to feel compelled to be me. If you are cerebral, I want you to invite the Spirit of God to come in and take over it and connect it to your heart. And if you are, I just feel this way and I, I feel that God loves me and I, I feel that he wants me to, to tell people about Jesus, I want you to take that and connect it cerebrally so that you are growing in experiential knowledge of who God is, and it's not just feelings, but it's actual conviction in your heart. So to be you. That's my new self. When I think about verse 12, I get a lot of feelings. Because it says, put off your old self. And, and right above, right above verses 5 through 11. Put off your old self, and in that... Christ is all. So if Christ is all, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So right there, he is saying, this is your new self. You are chosen and you are holy and you are beloved. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe that about myself all the time. Those are really hard things for me to believe. And so that's where the connection comes in. It's connecting um, my, my mind. And, and I like to say my guts because my heart betrays me often. So I, I, like, I like to connect the two. I don't feel chosen, holy, and beloved. So I'm going to, to speak it and pray it over my life until it becomes a reality of what I'm walking in. So I want to explain these things to you. God's chosen. Automatically, I, I think there's potential that some of you wince a little bit at that word chosen. That it's maybe was held over your head in the tradition that you grew up in. Or maybe you grew up in a tradition that's like, yeah, I'm chosen. So I, if you can put your preconceived ideas and notions about that word away for just a minute, just put it away and rest in the fact that you are in fact chosen by God. It is a privileged standing before God. It is not an entitlement or talking point, but a gift that compels us to action. It, it is something that is gifted to us. He, he chose us. And also in your booklet, I don't know if, there, I can't remember if I gave the references for the slide, but you don't have to write these down. Um, if you are confused about a passage in scripture, cross-reference it with the rest of scripture. Let scripture be your first guide into scripture. Not blogs, not websites, not your friend. Scripture first. And so that word chosen or elect, uh, are the verses? Yeah, they're tiny. But it's in your booklet, so you don't have to write those down. There's just a, a whole bunch of other verses that use that exact word, and that's just in the New Testament. So it is something that is spoken in scripture, that we are chosen by God. So we are God's chosen. Next, we are God's holy. We are his holy, which means we are the likeness of God. We are different from the world. It's the process of sanctification, restoration. Chad talked about it a couple weeks, of, weeks ago. In the restoration process, he is perfecting us. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion because we are being made holy. We are holy in the righteousness of Jesus, and we are being made holy. So we are God's chosen. We are God's holy. We are also God's beloved. I love this word. A choice that involves affection. And then we choose his choices because he loves us. So it's, it's this beautiful thing. And I, I know a few of your stories and and some of you have shared deeply personal things with me about your families and upbringing. And, and some of you have dads that you're like, yeah, I totally know what it means to be a beloved. That I was treated with that sort of reverence. And some of you don't. 
So it is a very difficult jump to come to the place of seeing yourself as wrapped up in the arms of the Father as a beloved. That he chose you not just with his mind. He's the God of the universe and he knows all things. He's in all things. He's through all things. He's for all things. But he also chose you with his emotion because you are his beloved. I find a lot of peace and loveliness in that. So when, when we put all three of these together, God chose, God sanctified, God made holy, and God loved, it is his work in us. So that, that first section, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, in what can we boast? Only God. So what, what is your new self? It is God doing what he does in you. And that is really, really hard for us, for those in the room, for those of us in the room, who if there's something to be done, we're going to get it done. If, if there is a task at hand, I'm going to work until it's complete. Now, and not all of you are like that. Hallelujah. That's, that's freedom. So you can say, yeah, I'm God's chosen, holy and beloved. And he does all the work. I don't have to do anything. My guess is there may not be anybody like that in here. We, we like the, if I do this, then God will do this. If I worship harder, if I pray harder, if I um, read my Bible more, if I memorize all the scripture on the yellow piece of paper, if I volunteer at the soup kitchen, if I get involved in Court of, court of Hope, if I do any of those things, then God has no choice but to love me. Well, he already chose you, so that's his choice, you. You're his choice, not what you do. So we don't have room to boast, which goes back to verse 11. He does the work and eliminates our ability to boast. He does the work in our new selves and, and eliminates our ability to boast. So I want to go back to verse 11 for just a second. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. He is where we boast. He does the work in us. He chose us. He's making us holy. And we are his beloved. Pretty basic. It is. It's kind of like what I said at the beginning of the retreat. It's like, here you go. It's what I got. But if we can start to walk in that, and I'm, I'm not boasting in this retreat. I'm not... I'm not boasting that my kids love Jesus. I, I'm not boasting that second mile has grown. I'm, I'm not boasting that we survived the pruning season. I'm not boasting that you came to the retreat. I, I'm not boasting that I got a gym membership for the first time in a couple years. I mean, I'm not boasting in any of that. It, it takes off the shackles of works and lets me rest in Jesus. And then what the beauty is, is he's working in me and I begin to see who he is instead of who I am. And then I, my, his image is reflected onto me because he is my life and he is all and Christ is in me. It eliminates our, our ability to boast. And um, last night I talked a lot about how our old self is put off. The choices we make, we put off. It is not who we are. And I uh, was talking with a friend of mine this morning, and, and I, I want to clarify this too. Your old self may contain things that were done to you, sins against you. That is your old self as well. That is not who you are. It, it does not define you, even though it probably feels cripplingly de definitive. But it, it, is not, it is not how God sees you. He sees you as his chosen one, his holy one, his beloved one. And when we deal with those deep things that are done towards us, we need to seek help. We, we don't just sit in a room and close the door and get out the Bible and hope things get better. You, you need help. That's why he gave us the body, which we're about to get into this whole passage. You, you, maybe you've never told anyone what happened to you. Talk to someone that you trust. Maybe talk to your community group leader. Talk to a friend. And then, friend, if you're the person who's talked to, you don't have to all, have all the answers. You say, I'm so, so sorry and sad. And you cry with your friend. And then you say, 
I don't know exactly what to do next, but let's get some help together. That, that is so important. I, I just wanted to reiterate that because I think a lot of times we focus on the choices that we make and not the choices that are made against us. Both are the old self. It is not God's design, and he is going to restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. 1 Peter 5.10. Okay, so how does all this come together? <clears throat> where, where does it land in? Because I started this retreat by saying, remember, this is talking to the church, but we've been focusing a lot on your old self, and how do you put that off? Well, we're about to get into really good communal living. And I, I want you to think of this as we're going through this. The local church is the visible expression of the global church. If you are online at all, and I pray that you don't see this. Sometimes I wonder if, if the people that I'm around leading are seeing these things. But currently, not the global, the global church is much different than the American church. My guess is the global church looks at the American church and is like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> so I, I'm not taking it to the whole global thing. Right now I'm taking it to the American church. We don't have a good reputation right now. It, it's not great. It's not looking good for us. But the reason, I think, one, because the enemy wants to destroy the church. He hates it. So he's a liar, and he's told people that the church is failing. But meanwhile, people are coming to Jesus still. But we, we have to be the church in our community. The local church is the visible expression of the global church. And so if you are frustrated and downtrodden with, with the, what you view the church to be, then link arms with something and do battle somewhere to push back the darkness. We are the, the expression of the church. And I am so glad I get to do this with you. I, I think that we're not perfect. But I think we love Jesus. We love to worship him. He's doing stuff in our midst. And let's, let's keep going. Let's be open to, God, what would you have us do next? I don't know what that is. My guess is it's going to be hard. But okay, I don't have to do it by myself, so let's do it. If we can continue to do it and link arms in our battle stance and push back the darkness... That is the visible expression of the global church that is to glorify Jesus. So as we go into this, we're going to um, move into what does putting on new clothes look like then? So what, what does our new self look like? If we're putting off the old clothes, and, and I want to review because I, I want you to, to remember the depth of disgust that our old clothes are. And it, it is, I think you will remember this for a long time because it's such a gross graphic illustration. But our old self, when we're walking in it, it's we're wearing poopy pants. We're just getting blistered butts because we don't care. I know my pants are poopy, but I'm just going to keep walking in them. Jesus loves me anyway. We, we put that off. So if we say, okay, we put that off, what do we do then? We don't, we don't just take off our poopy pants and then stand there because then we don't have any clothes on, right? So we have to do something. What does that look like? And that is what the, the rest of these verses are talking about. And it's so beautiful. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These are all gentle traits that ease life in close and intense community. If somebody tells you to get involved in Second Mile and go to a community group, it's going to be great and daisies and daffodils and everything's going to be fine and wonderful and lovely. It's never going to be hard or you're not going to have any problems and no one's ever going to offend you. They're lying. It's not true. It is hard to live in community. Do you know why? Because I sin and sometimes my sin splashes on you because you have agreed to walk life with me. You have to apologize to people and, and you have to deal with their weird quirks and, and you are around people who have completely different ideas than you. Do, you know, do you know how you deal with someone who has a completely different idea than you? With compassion, with kindness, with humility. Remember that verse I quoted last night, Proverbs 18.1, a fool finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in airing her own opinion. That's pride. And then meekness and patience. 
So compassion, the heart of compassion. This is an affectionate compassion. It involves emotion and deep feeling. Do you know I read that in the commentary? I did a little, because I, I can get that deep feeling. Now some of you are like, but that's not how God made me to be. Right, because it's God's work in you. It's not your work. So if you are thinking, I am not a compassionate person, I don't have those deep feelings. Good news, you don't have to. God is going to do that in you as you open up your life to him. Kindness. This is gracious sensitivity triggered by genuine care. So it's not just kindness. I, I saw something recently where it said Christianity does not equal kindness. And I wholeheartedly disagree because kindness is a fruit of the spirit. What I think the author was trying to say is Christianity does not equal niceness. So we don't have to be nice all the time, but we do need to be kind. I can very respectfully and kindly say, what you're doing is not right. You are offending people. You are, you are hurting yourself. You're hurting people around you. So it's genuine, gracious care. Meekness or gentleness, it's not demanding your own way. It's a gentle strength. If I, if I am meek, I am not saying this is going to happen my way. There are a lot of us in the world who are really uptight and like things how we like them. A good practice, I said this in my sessions a lot. Somebody would ask me a question, I'd be like, practice? That's, we have to practice our faith. We have to train ourselves. If you have a hard time being meek, being gentle, start with something smaller. Somebody says, this week at community group, can I do this and it just really gets on your nerves, meekness is to say, yes, give that a try. I'm going to pray for you in that. And not, God, help them see how stupid their idea is. But for their success, bearing with them. And then patience. The ability to not become frustrated by other shortcomings. <laughs> I really liked that definition. To tolerate their exasperating behavior. That means that we can say, your behavior is exasperating me, but I'm going to be patient. <laughs> to wait, this is so good, to wait a sufficient time to develop and express righteous anger. So I'm really annoyed at you. Your behavior is exasperating me, but I'm going to wait and see if I just need to get over myself or it's something we need to talk through. This is being long-tempered versus short-tempered. When I hear people say, oh, I have a temper. Well, surrender to Jesus. Don't brag about it. We brag about our shortcomings sometimes. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. If that comes out of your mouth, say, oh, I do not receive that over my life. I am not going to speak over my life that I'm impatient anymore. God, build patience into me. I talked about how these are feeling qualities. They're emotional things. But I want you to notice that these qualities are of the heart, but they involve engaging the discipline of the mind. It's a both and, again, it's wholeness. Chad's talked about this a lot recently. It's life, wholeness, and spiritual maturity. Your whole self, your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. That's, it, that's what it says to love God with, right? It doesn't say love God with your heart. Period, the end. Love God with your mind. Love God with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, everything that you have. So these qualities engage, are qualities of the heart that involve engaging the discipline of the mind. So that's where we are in the beginning. Easy things, new self. But it's, it's not like, oh, it's, it's this lovely stuff that we get to work through together. It, it doesn't say, put on your new clothes and walk around rebuking everybody and letting people rebuke you. It says, no, with compassionate hearts and kindness and humility, meekness and patience. Verse 13, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. This means we must deal redemptively with one another. We must. Must is a strong word, and I mean it. We must deal redemptively with one another. As we have been redeemed, so we offer forgiveness. And this implies that there will be trouble in community. First Peter 4 also implies it. It says, um, 
Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So that means we're going to get our junk on each other sometimes. We must deal redemptively with one another. And um, the funny thing is I think that we often, we often think of it as, the, uh, as we have an offense against someone else. They've hurt us so that we need to forgive them. But think about the fact that you are also going to have to be forgiven. You're, if you allow yourself to be part of community, you too are going to hurt others. And you must be open. If you recognize that you've hurt them, be diligent to go to them as soon as you realize it and say, I am so sorry that I hurt you. If someone comes to you and says, you really hurt me, your first response should not be but. That's the worst response, actually. If you need to say, okay, can I think about this a minute? If the, if the offense is deep enough and you just go, I'm so, so sorry, that means you're not thinking about how you've hurt them. You're trying to make them not be mad at you anymore. It's still about you. That, that, that isn't forgiveness either. The, as we bear with one another and we forgive each other, that comes in truly listening. It's the, what I've heard you say is this. And they say, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, tell me again. Because we, we speak different heart languages. We, we have different ways of saying things. And so we must be willing to say to people, I've been hurt and this is how. And then if we're the person receiving that, what I hear you say is, this is what I've done. Yes, that is. I'm truly sorry I hurt you. Can we talk about the situation? Really, really grown up things. Grown up things and not like the world. In the world, we make people mad, then we go on, and we hold grudges. We don't do that, not just with each other, but with the people in your life that don't know Jesus. If he's redeemed us and we show graciousness of Christ to them, doesn't that model to them a different way of living? It's, it's really quite lovely. And it goes to the next thing of putting on love in verse 14. And I think that's the first and. Yeah. And. Above all these, put on love. Put on love. <laughs> Above all. Which there's, there's a lot of things there already. I don't know if you're like, whoa, it's a lot of things to do. But don't picture it as this stack of bricks that you're holding. Okay, so to put on my new clothes, I need to, to have a compassionate heart and kindness and meekness and, and gentleness and, and patience. Oh, and then I have to forgive. And then what, what am I going to have to do next? And, and, and. That's not new clothes. You know what it is? It's like steps. Put on compassionate hearts. And put on kindness. And put on faithfulness. And put on forgiving each other. And put on love. So it isn't burdensome. Our new clothes are not burdensome. They lift us up. He, he is our glory. In Psalm 3 it says, the Lord will bestow glory on you and he will lift up your head. So if we're living in our old selves and we're working out discipline for the sake of discipline, then we're trudging along like this. And it's heavy and it's, and it's hard. And Psalm 3 says he will bestow glory on you and he will lift up your head. So these things are to lift us up also. We climb them up in our new clothes because if I'm wearing poopy pants, do I want to stand on top and say, look at my poop? No, but if I'm wearing the robes of Christ and, and compassion and gentleness, then I may not want to do, look at my new clothes, but I most certainly want to say, look at Jesus. And so if I can wear the most beautiful, picture the most amazing, elegant gown that you, you can imagine, like Cinderella's godmother could never even begin to imagine. That doesn't even compare. It, it doesn't even hold a candle to Christ's righteousness on you. So we stand and we're like, wow, look at my new clothes. Look at my new clothes. Instead of saying, nope, I'm not going to forgive them. Forget it. Nope, I'm happy in my crap. Or, uh-uh, not going to be patient. Their behavior exasper exasperates me. I can't even tell you. An angel has no idea how annoying that person is. I do. I've got some annoying people in my life. But I love them. <laughs> 
and I asked God to, to help me be patient, and it's not any of you, don't worry. It's Chad, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, with love, love is the binding agent of all of it. Without love, forget it. It's not going to happen. And this, this word specifically in, in this passage is agape love. Which again, we, if you grew up in the church, we have these preconceived notions. Like agape is unconditional love. No. Agape is divine love. It's, we often attribute it to call it unconditional because we don't understand divinity. But when we say it's unconditional, I think it diminishes what divine love is. So agape love is divine love. And if you want to know what divine love means, search God's love and then look at all the ways it describes God's love. Uh, most of them are unfailing. He doesn't fail. And uh, as, as this agape love put on love, it's God-directed love that then trickles down to others. It doesn't start here and come up. It's directed to God and then comes down to others. God-directed love that trickles down to others. And going back to 2 Timothy 3 that I talked about last night, we can get caught up in misdirected love. That is not divine love. That is selfish love. It is about self and about others and money and pleasure and all of those things that I talked about last night. And so it, it skews our view of our new clothes. It is not about your heart. Um, another quote by Beth Moore, I quoted Jackie Hill Perry yesterday. The world chirps, follow your heart. We can follow our hearts straight to hell. Do what's right, then plead, God, help me feel what's right. The breastplate of righteousness is fierce armor over feeble human hearts. Every single time we feel the wrong thing, but do the right thing. So what that is saying, and I talked about this in one of my sessions this morning, the world says follow your heart. No, do not follow your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately sick, who can understand it? That's what the heart is. So we say, God, protect my heart. Guard my heart. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Make my feelings your truth. So if I don't feel like I want to get up and open my Bible, I choose to do it. I put on the breastplate of righteousness, choose what is right, and ask him to make my feelings alive with what is true. We're not saying, I'm going to do this and hope that eventually I'll do the right thing. No, I'm going to choose to do the right thing and hope my feelings align with truth. And I'm saying that, and I'm a deep feeler, you guys. I'm not saying that it's an easy thing, but our hearts will deceive us. We must be careful. <laughs> okay, harmony and perfection. I really like that section too. And above all, he's put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I know not everybody is super musical in here, but I think that everyone in here can hear music that is good and be able to appreciate it. Like Justin Bieber or Taylor Swift. Or, <laughs> just kidding. Just make sure you're listening. To, to hear the most amusing, uh, amusing, it could be amusing, amazing symphony on the planet and how all of the instruments weave together. That is what putting on love looks like in perfect harmony. The, and think about the original harmony. The original harmony is the Trinity. Three parts, perfect harmony, beautiful, beautiful display of harmony. And then the beautiful harmony of the life of Jesus. So the, the first we're talking about three-part harmony with the Trinity. When you think about the life of Jesus, harmonious in his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and then his second coming. That is what love is. The perfect harmony of all of those things. There is not a sour note in the Trinity at all or in the life of Jesus. And God-directed agape love holds us together as women and holds our community together. God-directed love, not selfish love. If we enter into community with selfishness, it doesn't build us up. And, and that's not pressure because we do enter in community with some needs. And, and that's why we have each other. I have needs, you have needs. Jesus meets those needs first and he gives us one another to help each other. Uh, people have said, hey, can I pray for you this weekend? Yes, I am in need 
but it is God-directed first because they're, they're talking to God on my, my behalf. If I'm like, I, I, just, I just need to cry and vent and for you to tell me how good I am, then it's me-directed love and it, it's, it uh, tears community down. We are one body bound by love. Romans 12 4 through 5 says, Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We all belong to each other. Again, not American concept at all. But we belong to each other. We are sisters. If Christ is in you and he is in me, we are sisters. We belong together. Verse 15, the peace of Christ. Wholeness. Life, wholeness, and spiritual maturity. It is not having a divided mind. It's casting your, all your anxieties on him. Casting your anxieties on him. Giving him, literally taking your anxieties and giving them to him because he cares for you. Not having a divided, divided mind. The peace of Christ first rules in our hearts and then rules in our relationships. It is an essential part of our relationships. So verse 15 again, I want to read it. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body. If I am not peaceful, I'm going to be divisive in our body. And I, and I am not talking about the peace of I'm okay and you're okay. It's I am going through really hard things. The night is holding on to me right now, the song that we just sang. But I'm going to choose to say, even if my feelings aren't feeling it, I'm going to choose to believe that God is good. Will you help me? That's peace. It's not, it's not a fairy tale. I hope you can get there and we can all be happy together. It's helping one another through enabling each other to look to Jesus. And be thankful. And, and, and. And let the peace of Christ be in your hearts. And be thankful. It's, it's this beautiful stuff of, of goodness. Um, surely, why well, don't I want to put that burden on you? Possibly, many of you have read things that if you're stuck in a pit, start to be thankful. Just start to list all of the things that you can think of to be thankful. It works. It really, really works. It, it is really interesting how I can be in just the pit of fussiness. And the Spirit of God says, why don't you be thankful for a minute? So I'll just list everything that I can think of in my mind out loud. Um, I've been going on walks in the morning, and it's, if, I'm sure people think I'm crazy because I'm praying out loud, and my hands are going. I'm walking in the circle at Udall. When people pass me, I do this, and then I get back at it. <laughs> and one of the things that I've been doing lately is just trying to list all of the things that I can think of to be thankful, and it lifts my head and brings peace, and be thankful. You don't know where to start? Just list the names of the people in your community group. Even if you don't know what to be thankful for them because they exasperate you, God, I am thankful. I am thankful that they bear your image. I'm thankful that they are created by you. Verse 16. We're just flying through this tonight. Does it feel like, no? <laughs> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you which, richly. Let the word dwell in you richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. I'm going to stop right there for now. Wisdom found in the word of God. Again, I just beat it. I would tell you like a dead horse, but it's not dead. It's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The wisdom found in God. You want to put on your new self, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Whatever that looks like for you. Reading is hard for you. Get, a, get it on your iPod or your phone and listen to it everywhere you go. Listen to it. Listening to God's word will change your life too. If, if memorizing isn't your thing, fine. I was listening to Beth Moore, actually, and her daughter share an interview. And Melissa, her daughter, doesn't memorize scripture. You know why? Because she's learning Greek and Hebrew. So what's your excuse for not memorizing scripture? <laughs> learning Greek and Hebrew? Great. Come teach me. But if it's because you're too busy, I, just stop. Just, I don't want to hear it. If it's because it's hard for you, yeah. 
It is hard. And maybe that isn't where God would have you right now. Maybe he would have you push play in your car. I don't know. I don't know how God's word needs to dwell in you personally, richly, but I do know it does need to dwell in you. That's what needs to dwell in you. Not the wisdom of the world. Not the folly of the world. Not, not I like NPR, but if I'm only listening to NPR, I am heavy and bogged down and blah. When I notice that, whew, turn it off. Set my mind on things above, not on earthly things. Because I do not believe being ignorant is the way to be a Christian. I, I think we have plenty of those, thank you. I want to know what is happening in the world so I can respond with Jesus. He put me here for a reason. If he didn't want me to be affecting the world when I gave my life to him, he would have taken me to heaven. But he put me here with all of you in Tucson, Arizona for a reason. So I want to lift up my head, look around as his word is dwelling in me richly in all wisdom. A lot of times it's dwelling in me, but I don't have wisdom about it yet, so I keep my mouth shut. I'm quiet about it. I'm waiting for the wisdom from heaven to come and show me this week that and do this and do that and do this. It wasn't for whatever reason, the Spirit of God did this lovely thing. Sometimes when I see and lists, I'm like, oh, it's a lot of work. But as I was reviewing this, I was like, oh, and we get to do that, and we get to do that, and we get to do that. That was the wisdom that I received this week that I got to speak out to you tonight. With this, we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. This is the hard part. We are teaching, we are giving instruction and imparting knowledge to each other. I need and want to learn from you. If you are believing the lie that I, there is nothing that I can learn from you, it, it's just a lie. That you belong to me. And what God is teaching you, I can learn from. As scripture is standing out to you, I want to hear it. I want to know what God is teaching you. We all get to teach each other. That's what this says. It says teaching and admonishing one another. It doesn't say let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and keep it there for your little secret pleasure. It says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you can teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And admonishing means urging people to choose God's best. Admonishing doesn't mean rebuking. I don't know if you've ever had one of those rebuke in your lives. And to be honest, I probably was that when I was in college. They're not fun. But admonishers, urging you to choose God's best. A rebuker is, sinner, repent. An admonisher is, this isn't God's best for you. Choose God's best. But you know how you're going to be able to tell someone God's best? By knowing the word. Because your best for them isn't the best. It's your best. And then singing. Here we are again with singing. I told you last night, if you don't like singing, better start practicing because we're going to do it in heaven a lot. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Interesting, again, once again, here we are with scripture, singing psalms. That, that's what they sang in their church, was the psalms, scripture. So we sing. When we are singing together as a body, it is a spiritual practice of worship. Do you want to know the reason you enjoy it so much? Because Jesus is enjoying it, and you are God's. He is your life. Christ is your life. He is all. That is why we enjoy singing. The key word here is spiritual, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's where the Holy Spirit imparts faith. As we are singing to him with one another, the Holy Spirit is imparting faith to us. He's revealing Christ. He's bolstering our identity as holy and beloved. I mean, I think that's, that's the most beautiful thing about God. He wants our worship. He wants it. And it, and it isn't a selfish, give me your worship, daughters. It's a, ah, I want your worship. And then I'm, I'm going to bless you beyond measure because you are my holy and beloved. He delights in us singing to him and singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. And then we are reminded that we are holy and beloved. He is a giving father. He, we cannot outgive him. We can sing. We can have the best voice today. If you're a singer, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, whoa, that song, that sound, that tone, it's so smooth. It's coming out of my throat. 
And he's like, oh, no, let me now sing over you. Zephaniah 3, 19, 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let that, that verse be fresh in you tonight. Some of you maybe have heard it too many times that it's just words. But the God of the universe, the creator of the world, exalts over you, not just with singing, with loud singing. How, how loud is that? God's loud singing? Like there are sometimes on Sunday morning, I'm like, wow, people are singing loud. But the God of the universe exalts her over us with loud singing. Why? Because he chose us. He's making us holy. We're his beloved. He delights in us. He, he is singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs over us. And we, in turn, as our love is directed towards him, it trickles down onto each other. That, that is new clothes. That changes worship for me. I, I don't care if I'm having the worst voice day ever. I want to sing loud so that I can honor God and bless my family. So that my, I, I, I call them the, the Twin Towers on, on Sunday morning. My favorite place to be is to stand right between Kyle and right between Chad. And for whatever reason, they press in on me. Because I like to worship like this. But with them, I'm like this. But they, as I hear them singing as loud as they can, it compels me to sing louder, to sing bigger, to sing the top of my lungs to Jesus. So your voice... Whether you think you can sing or not, it will compel me to sing louder. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a spiritual mystery. Again, it's like baptism and communion. That's what worship is as well. New clothes. This deep, unfailing love that he has for us causes us to love him more, to love one another more, and to put off our old self and to see that we are, in fact, chosen, holy, and beloved. I already said that, but it was written on the paper. Uh, it, it is. That, that is it. You, you are not going to find your identity in anything you do. Um, anything that you do that you're finding your identity in is your old self. And that, that doesn't mean that we can't be good at what we do. But if that thing was taken from you, will you be devastated? Then that's your identity. That I, I had to wrestle with that a lot when I had my stroke. That I, I had a lot of irrational fears because of where the stroke happened. I, it was in my emotional processing center, so I couldn't process. And I had a, a lot of irrational fears. And I've shared this illustration before, so some of you have heard it, that this was the end of my life, that this was it. And I need to get my sock drawer in order so it doesn't annoy Chad when he's having to go through my socks because his are all color coordinated and mine are just stuffed in there. And I have to go through all my kids. I, I saved their... Um, all their work. So I have to make sure so that no one's annoyed if I'm going through it. And, and even uh, I remember dropping kids off at school one morning and saying, God, I just love them so much. I can't leave them. And I felt so clearly in my spirit, I love them more. And in that moment, I realized my identity was them. It was my family. And being able to release them, which by the way, is a continual process, I didn't release him that day. Oh, new self and family, be blessed, and God's got you. It's, it's a continual process of, of laying down those things that I find my identity in. And I, I most certainly struggle with that as a mom and as a wife and as a women's minister. I mean, do you know how long it's taken me to find a title for what I do? Finally got one, women's minister. <laughs> <laughs> Profound, right? Thanks. It's creative. But I can find my identity in that, and then I start to get lost. It's my old self. My, my identity, my new self is that I am God's chosen one. I am holy. I am beloved. My love is directed to God, and then what he asks me to do is trickle down to others in divine, agape, God-directed love. And then we link arms, and we go, okay, you don't have this today, friend? It's all right. I got you. People turn to me and say, Angel, you don't have this today? And I go, it's okay, I got you. We, we aren't all going to be sprinting all the time. I, I do want you to not let anything worm into my house. 
I don't want you to. Um, I, I want you to watch out for me. I want to watch out for you. And, and again, if we all stood up, which we may do this tomorrow, and linked arms, you can't link your arms with all 25 people over here. But you can link, the arms, with, link arms with people in your proximity, in your community, in your group. But there's always room for another. And sometimes the blob gets so big that we separate a little bit, not in souls and hearts and minds, but in proximity so that we're constantly making room for others. I'm going to be on the watchtower for you, and I want you to be on the watchtower for me. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver, is that Oliver back there screaming? Yes. We're linking arms with him, man. Raise up that child. Is that okay, Katie, if we all link arms with him? Pray for him. I, I am going to continue to pray for you. I am not so naive to think that everyone is like, yes, I'm going to put on my new self and I'm chosen, holy, and beloved. I, I don't, I, I know that that is hard. I, I have been walking this a lot longer than a lot of you, not all of you, but it, I said this in my, my session this morning, I keep saying that. I've been doing this for a long time. I have been seeking Jesus for a long time and I have fallen on my face plenty of times and I will again. But by the grace of God, I'm going to keep going. And one of the things, I was telling Rahel this before dinner, one of the things that I prayed for my children since I knew they were going to be my kids is that if they ever face the choice to walk away from their faith, they would feel like if they left, they would lose everything. That they, they would be utterly without. So then therefore they would not make that choice. Get it? <laughs> but that is how I feel. What, what choice do I have? What do I have without Jesus? I, I don't know. It would be a really, really dark place. Because life's really hard with him. So what in the world is life like without him? So that, that's what I want you to have. I want you to leave tomorrow to, to come into the next session that, or to the next part of this session with an open heart of, God, what is the next step you would have me take? Maybe it is to talk to a friend about, I'm not sure what to do. Can you help me? Or maybe it's, it's time to stop making excuses and I need to mentor someone. Or maybe it's, um, I am going to talk to my friend who I know needs counseling and I'm going to challenge her to have counseling. Or maybe it's, I know I need to talk to a professional about things that have happened and I'm going to do that. Or maybe it's, I'm going to start reading Matthew because I don't really know Jesus that well. So what is it that you are going to say, I... I don't know what I would do without you, Jesus, but I know I'm going to do this next thing. I'm going to choose, I'm going to pray every day that you will help me believe that I am chosen, holy, and beloved. That, that probably is a great thing for all of us to do. God, help me believe that I am chosen, holy, and beloved. To learn what that means. We are going to spend some time in worship right now. And I think the temptation may be to separate a little bit and to start to contemplate now. But I'm going to challenge you with something to not do that yet. Because your self-contemplation without focusing first on Jesus will fall short. And so in order for us to put on our new clothes, we need to focus on God for a while. God-focused and allow his holiness to trickle down on us. And then after we sing those songs, and it may be really hard because you may be like, but I have this thing I really want to process with Jesus right now. He'll wait for eternity. He's not going anywhere. So you have three songs to sit and be patient. So focus on God right now. And then after that, as is tradition, but this is a tradition that still serves us, we are going, Angela's just going to play a lot of really lovely old worship songs and that is our time to spread around the room and pray for you to engage and journal um, there may or may not be crying but again do not be put off by it because it's really none of your business it's what God is doing uh, let me retract that it is your business if you see someone crying pray for them 
because we belong to each other. We belong to each other. But then don't get distracted, you empathetic people. I need to go and help them. <laughs> Let God deal with you first. And then if you need prayer, the prayer team will be standing, sitting. I don't know what they're going to do, but they'll be against the back walls behind the speaker so that it can be heard, and they will pray for you. Not, they're not going to be counseling tonight. They're going to be prayerful for you. So that is an option after the last three songs. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. God, on one hand, I just, I feel fired up and I just want it so much for me and for all of my lovely, strong, fierce sisters. And on the other hand, I just feel open-handed like, yeah, this is it. What else can we do but seek you? So in this time, would your Holy Spirit minister to us through these songs and hymns and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that we are about to sing to you, that you would minister to us through your voice over us and to our voices to you around us. Help us to so focus on you as we are one body, as we sway together as one body, as we maybe kneel together as one body and how we open our hands. And even for our friends that aren't quite ready to open hands, those of us who want to, we stand in the gap on their behalf and say we'll open our hands for them until they're ready. We do, we do love you, but again, it, it pales in comparison to how you love us. Thank you that we are your chosen ones. You chose us, not for entitlement, because you love us. And that we are holy in your sight, that we are like you. We are like your son and that we are beloved. Not just loved, but beloved. Thank you. Amen.